Rebecca Dinerstein Knight is the author of the novel and screenplay The Sunlit Night and a collection of poems, Lo Fodden. Her nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times and the New Yorker Online, among others. Uh, she was born and raised in New York City and lives in New Hampshire. And Anna Wiener is a contributing writer to the New Yorker Online, where she writes about Silicon Valley startup culture and technology. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, New York, The New Republic, and N Plus One, as well as in Best American Not Required Breeding 2017. Uh, Anna lives in San Francisco. Uh, Rebecca, Anna, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, take it away. Cool. Thank you for having us. This is such a pleasure. Um, it's lovely to see you, Becky. Me and you, Anna. <laughs> um, there's no real natural flow, I think, to a bookstore event done in one's own kitchens. Um, but I think maybe we were, we were discussing starting off with you doing a little reading from your book, um, which I have here. Do you have your own book? You must. Wow, how nice, how great. Um, Anna, thank you for having lunch with me. This is really, <laughs> I was so excited when Anna agreed to do the event uh, in San Francisco, and then I assumed all was lost, and then she very vigorously and creatively engineered basically the lunch we're about to eat, and I could not be more appreciative. So um, it's a hoot and I'm very happy to be here. Um, what? I'm going to read a little bit. Um, there's so much food in this book. We just thought it would be nice. There have been a couple of evening Zoom events and we're all also at our computers during the day. We thought a daytime lunchtime thing might be a little bit jolly and there's so much food in this book that I thought I'd read um, like the this the quote sometimes a banana with coffee is nice is how the book starts. So we're really right there. I'm going to read just the first two paragraphs to introduce the narrator and then um, her feelings on tortellini and then we'll get cooking. Um, cool. Uh, I guess so Hex is a new book. It's a novel. It's pretty short. It's pretty uh, sassy. Uh, it's just six characters who fall in love with each other at the same time and um, have to figure out what they want from each other and how to get it. Um, in the middle of it, Nell Barber, who I'm about to introduce, is studying poisonous plants and their own antidotes. Um, and she has been expelled from her PhD program, so she's doing that alone in a, in a state of isolation that is weirdly familiar right now. Um, so here's the beginning of Hex. I am a woman who wakes up hungry. Tom touched only coffee till noon. You do what you're capable of at some point, so Tom and I left each other. I wanted breakfast, he wanted liberty, and who could blame either of us? I live alone now in a large, rancid, blown out loft in outer Red Hook, where I pat around the soft wood floors like a toddler. I've taken my pants off, my rings, earrings. It's quiet and bright. I haven't gotten any lamps. I can hardly move. I'm drunk, and I take a probiotic. My name is Nell Barber. I'm five foot five and 130 pounds, which is not in any way remarkable. My daddy was a nice Jewish boy who married a nice Christian girl and raised me in Kansas and got on with it. Neither of them observed anything ever again. I was born observant. They gave me the original, fearful, organized minds of their childhoods and no religion of my own to honor. I suppose I turned from the celestial to the dirt. I study plants and I live in order. Just because Rachel Simons made sustained contact with thallium and absorbed its toxins through her potassium uptake channels and died, the university expelled all six members of our lab. They couldn't tolerate another ounce of our hazard. The disciplinary committee stood in coral formation and issued what sounded like whale tones run through a vocoder. Be gone, be gone, they groaned. Our Experiment in toxicology had taken the life of a valued graduate student and would no longer be institutionally condoned. I wore a hazmat suit to the hearing to promise future caution. The chairman found this disrespectful, and I could hardly see his apoplectic face through the scratched plastic front of my secondhand helmet. Columbia couldn't accuse us. Rachel had oxidized the thallium of her own volition, 
at her own risk and to her own demise. But it could close down the environment in which she'd endangered herself and rescind our school-wide welcome. We had broken the contract of care and common responsibility that characterized the Columbia student. If we couldn't study safely, we couldn't study. It made good sense, but it deleted me. The finalized verdict came via a specially assembled summer committee by a priority mail to Tom's address, which I would just kissed goodbye without any tongue. August is supposed to be a lazy month, but it pummeled my partnership and my PhD. The biggest loss is you, my chime, my floorboard. You are my night milk. You are my unison. You believe in the periodic table. Your book sold 8,000 copies in its first week. Columbia will separate you from the Simons case and nurture your celebrity. For five years, I've been your smaller self, your near peer, your sane challenger, your favorite. For five years, I've trailed you as you approached success. Then Rachel reached for the rat poison and whole thing reached its readers and my room lost its pillars in one coordinated catastrophe and neatly fell down. You and Tom have both conclusively shaken me. Look, Joan, I'm shaking. Um, so that's just the introduction of Nell's basic situation. She's working on this project She's obsessed with her mentor whom she can no longer study with and she's trying to figure out how to continue to be the person she knows herself to be without any of the context that she's ever had. Um, and she solves this problem largely by eating frozen tortellini um, and uh, so picking up on the dedication to Joan that we just heard in the opening, um, she says, don't worry, Joan, I check myself. I check myself and I wreck myself. Sometimes I make tortellini and even if I make only half the bag, call it 1.5 portions. I pour it steaming into my bowl and I look at it and I think, nobody in the whole world deserves this much tortellini. I love it so much, it doesn't need any topping. Each tortellinus is a self-sufficient packet of perfect food. I love best the unforgivably dank tricolor frozen kind, manufactured by mass brands that put ammonium bicarbonate and cracker meal into this ricotta stuffing. Tortellini that is probably unhygienic even while it's frozen. I can't believe I get to eat it. Same trouble with a box of Kraft spirals and cheese. A whole box feels like the ideal portion size to my body, but my mind knows it's supposed to feed five or whatever children, and to hog it is unconscionable sin. It's okay. I use the empty box as one brick in my temple wall. I don't mean my body as temple. We both know my body to be a rectangle with rounded corners. I mean the temple I'm building to worship life. Yeah, let's make some lunch. I do want to add that doing a lunch event, one in which you demonstrate to me how to make what I would call a um, fulfilling and yet highly unambitious recipe. It feels appropriate not only because we're in this moment of the cooking tutorial, um, where like every time I open Instagram, someone from some part of my life who I didn't even think knew how to like salt water is, is doing a cooking tutorial on how to make something, but also because of this book, contain some of the most rhapsodic, pleasurable, um, raucous descriptions of food that I have read in recent in That's memory. so fun. <laughs> there's one, I just have to say, there's one that I think will haunt me forever in which um, a character is described eating sesame noodles at a Chinese oh. restaurant, I think. And they are described as, as um, hanging out of his mouth like a car wash. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it's like, I, I may never eat a noodle um, again the same way. So just to say, all 10 of them shoved into my mouth, dang it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I took great pleasure in reading a lot of your descriptions of food. And I also just sort of loved the way you have these two elements in the book where there are toxic things that can be ingested and then things that could, are supposed to be pleasurable that are ingested but are sort of horrifying and um, just this balance that I thought was really smart. So it seems appropriate that we should be eating something hopefully non-toxic. Hopefully um. <laughs> non-toxic, but <laughs> dealing with eggs is always a salmonella. Um, that's so fun, Anna, thank you. And it's especially 
to hear you um, choose the, the cold sesame noodles because I affiliate them so powerfully with the Chinese restaurants in Park Slope that um, I also think of as your neighborhood, even if you never went to them. I don't know if you spent much time in your own local Chinese restaurants, but uh, it feels connected to me as well. <laughs> Yeah, I should. I feel we should mention um, to people watching, uh, which is also quite funny because on the Zoom interface, all I see, I know that there are people here, but it's mm -hmm. just me and Booksmith. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's like an intimate um, <laughs> reunion. Uh, but to people who are watching who don't know me or Becky, Becky and I have known each other since 2001. Um, we went to high school together and then I think sort of lost touch after college. So this is sort of a reunion, uh, which which is delightful, but I also feel a deep, um, I don't know, it's, I think it's an unusual thing to share a childhood with someone, and especially at Stuyvesant, where we went to high school, was an incredibly unusual place to be. Um, so a deep kinship or something. So I, uh, but no, I never, I never really, I wasn't like a woman on the town at the Chinese restaurants in Park Slope growing up, but I am familiar with the uh, New York City style of uh, sesame noodle. <laughs> um, well, let's get started. We yeah. have some special guests to introduce. Um, my husband is here with our chickens, who are the sources of the eggs we'll be cooking today. So, uh, without any further ado, <laughs> presenting. This is Kyoto. And this is Amber. Amber. I can never remember the name of this one. We have two guys with this but. Amber is a little more amber colored and her sister Heather has a little bit more gray in the feathers and also Heather has a broken beak, but, but not Amber. And um, this chicken, Kyoto, <laughs> much larger, lays very small eggs. And this chicken, as you'll see, though much smaller, lays enormous eggs. Enormous. Eggs that seem like they should not be able to come out of this chicken, but they do. <laughs> the dog is licking the chicken's foot right now under the table. It's really a full, very... <laughs> this is <laughs> not for right words. Um, Anyways. Have those chickens. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's like incredibly ominous. I think chickens must be smart enough to know that they shouldn't be in the in, in the kitchen. Like, if you're in the kitchen, like you're, you know. They don't want to be there. Fear of God. <laughs> and also, they've never been here before. They live outside in the chicken coop. Um, we we moved into a house that was previously an industrial chicken farm. Um, so there's this like incomprehensibly large building in our backyard that used to house 7,500 chickens. Um, oh but God. we have three. You just met two of them because he could only carry two of them at a time. Um, and those three chickens live in a corner of this chicken coop that could, I mean, it's a big house for them. Um, and uh, that's, like, that's decadent. It's that's super really decadent. Poultry decadence. Poultry decadence is really. <laughs> should be our Wi-Fi network name or something. I don't know what that should be, but something. Um, so, all right, let's, uh, let's move to the kitchen counter. Great. Uh, Here are the eggs that those chickens laid. Um, and uh, look at that beautiful, colorful setup, too. I love the turquoise calendar and the eggs, how nice. Um, these are the eggs that the sound was talking about that are so large. I don't know if you'll attempt this. Becky, can you get closer to the mic, please? I realize this is a joke, joke experiment we're doing, but oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, totally. Can you hear me? That's much better. Great. So here is a giant egg. I don't know if you have a sense of scale on this, but like an egg in relation to your hand should not be this big. It's almost <laughs> like a goose, like a goose or an ostrich egg. Like here's a, so here's a more normal sized egg that Kyoto, the larger chicken lay and laid. And then here is her, um, Amber's egg, which is like almost twice as big. Uh, so that's just what's going on. How big um, is the yolk? I mean, I guess we'll see. Lots of suspense at this event today. <laughs> Yeah, I won't ruin it, but I but don't get too excited either. Uh, so, he, but the nice thing is that so those three chickens lay three eggs a day. They each lay one egg a day, which is not something that I knew about chickens before I had them. Like, I don't think of any animal laying an egg a day in, in any kind of like fertility cycle, but uh, chickens. <laughs> 
chickens do. So we at all times have this like big basket full of um, eggs, which is really nice and especially nice right now. Um, I'm gonna back up to my stove top a little bit and if you can't hear me, just holler. Uh, how's that? That's good. Great. Um, all right, guys. So we're making a really basic egg <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> Basically, couldn't be simpler because we're not. No, we're. It's not about. It's not about the cooking today. It's about the pleasure. Um, so I know everybody's been baking a lot of bread. I too have been baking some bread. I would say my favorite bread that I've baked uh, is the Bon Appetit. Shock easy, no need focaccia, which turns out to be shockingly easy and very bubbly and delicious. Um, so I love that, but I haven't made just like a regular sandwich bread yet. Uh, so today I'm just going to be using some truly ordinary whole wheat sandwich bread, but it's got some nice seeds in it. Um, I would love to hear in the comments what kind of bread you are using today because I'm sure it's very, very delicious. <laughs> Um, I, for no reason, like to have egg sandwiches open-faced, so like a fried egg on a piece of bread and then another fried egg on another piece of bread, not assembled. And I don't know why I like that, but that's the way we're going to do it today. And so, uh, let's get started. Nah. Rebecca, Sorry. while you are turning on the stove and buttering the pan and yeah. cracking the eggs, um, I want to ask you a little bit about <laughs> voice in your book. Um, because I heard you say that this, that Nell's voice sort of came to you almost in the night, um, which, sorry, that sounds very dramatic, but that Nell's voice sort of emerged in your head and you had to get it down and it was sort of this rush. Yeah. Um, which <laughs> any other writer of fiction is probably like, fuck you. <laughs> that is the, that's the dream. Um, but I'm curious about the process of writing and of staying in that voice, especially, uh, you know, given all of the, you, you also write poetry, you write in different registers, you write um, uh, screenplays. How did you sustain that? I mean, was it difficult to, to, to stay in that, uh, in her head? I mean, what was, what was the process like for you? Yeah, it's a really nice question. Um, I'm going to throw this bread on the pan. Yeah, I'll I do my best to follow suit. <laughs> toast, a, toast a bread in the pan. I don't have a toaster, actually, but I, I think a little olive oil pan toast is extra special anyway. Um, so I'm just going to throw these suckers right in the pan, push them down a little bit, and then leave them. Um, uh, it's a beautiful question. Um, this book... Yeah, this voice, it was, it's, it's essential attitude was so um, pronounced from the get go and it really carried its own, its own weight and its own speed. And I, um, I don't know why that is. I, I had just left the city and moved. I was sort of on my way to New Hampshire, but was in Hudson, New York at the time. And there was something about the out outward energy of, of leaving the city and looking back at it and feeling frustrated with various elements of its social hypocrisies, but also feeling um, removed from it and missing it and all of those things that just created a, an attitude that um, just, uh, I, I wrote the book pretty quickly, I think because I couldn't have sustained it for much longer than the, the the series of months I worked on it um, but during those six months or so it was really really vibrant and I just I worked every morning I, I worked every morning from nine to one or so and then in the afternoons and evenings I would take notes sort of just as things like on, on riffs that would be still on my mind and then I'd plug them in in the morning and keep going and um, it really chugged itself along. But that's so different than the process I had writing my first novel, which took six years and enormous rewrites. And um, it, that was really slow and laborious. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I hadn't, I guess I hadn't put together the time frame. I, I suppose in my head, I thought you had moved to write this book, that it was already 
underway. Um, did you, just hearing you talk about it, did you sort of feel that you were writing it against New York, against the sort of, um, you know, often skin crawling literary scene <laughs> or the sort of, <laughs> um, uh, you know, ambition and uh, professionalism that, that sort of collapses into, um, I don't know, creative circles? Did, I, I just, I'm just curious if it felt like almost a rebuke to the life that you were leaving and also, I don't know, just how you thought about that, uh, writing about New York as someone who's from Manhattan um, and, you know, what, it, what, how those things all tie together. It, a highly articulate question that surely no, will be. No, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a really good question that's right at the heart of the book. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it was never really about the literary community exactly because, um, the book actually has nothing to do with the literary community. It's about like an academic community and scientific community. And um, I actually think the literary community is one of the most miraculously like warm hearted industries you can be a part of in the city. So that wasn't my um, steering, but what I was feeling is that the sort of overarching um, sense of uh, rhythm of comparisons that comes up in the city. I just want to check my bread real quick. Okay, bread is burnt, so we're off to a great start. I'm going to take it out of the pan and just put it right on the plate. And then while it's nice and hot, I'm just going to sprinkle a little salt on it just to give it a little something. And even a little black pepper too. Because if you have your salt and pepper under your eggs, on your bread, you know they're in there. Um, and while that bread is hot, I'm also gonna put a little bit of sliced cheese on each slice um, that we're then gonna put the eggs on top. I'm sorry, Anna, this, <laughs> we didn't, um, we didn't I'm know really how the time work I'm like, might start a fire. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm just gonna <laughs> um, So to answer your question, um, I was really looking at sort of the general dynamics of envy and um, comparison that I found relentless in the city across industries. Um, that there is this constant measurement of success levels that we were incapable of accurately measuring in each other, mostly because we do have such different um, trades and professions. And so there's this huge margin of error in which everybody becomes infinitely capable of presenting themselves as um, satisfied or dissatisfied uh, to degrees that often don't match our own sense of ourself or our understanding of that person. There's a lot of presentation and a lot of self-consciousness and a lot of jealousy that all felt um, needless and inaccurate at a certain point. Um, and I, I was re really eager to just take a step out of it. Um, and I think that remove is what Nell sort of sits in, trying to look at it from a distance and, and figure out her own ambition. It's not Nell is super ambitious in her own field and very serious and very trained, um, but she doesn't really know how to compete and she doesn't really know how to prove herself against others, um, which is like a totally different skill set that some people master and some people don't. Um, so I think that was that was more the the look um, looking back at New York. That makes sense. That's interesting. It's uh, there's this sort of wonderful quiet moment in the book that passes really quickly where she acknowledges how hard she's worked and how nobody knows it but her, but that she's just, she's been so committed and worked her ass off and it's, uh, it kind of goes unsaid and a lot of this like envy and ambition um, gets bundled up into lust and gets, it's, it's, it's almost like because she's kept that to herself, it's just radiant in every direction. Um, I guess, <laughs> but it, one of one of the questions I had for you was um, there's so so much about this love story is is about pro and I, I think it's fair to call it a love story. What do you think? It's, yeah. it's complicated. <laughs> Definitely a love story. Yeah, yeah, in in multiple directions. Yeah. But, um, I it's a love story that at its core sort of hinges on projection, 
which ties into this ambition and into this uh, this prof professional desire, but a kind of like placelessness within that. Um, and I'm just curious if, uh, if in writing that you were thinking about this idea of projection, there are these really interesting moments where she, the, the object of Nell's uh, lust and desire and whatever else you might bundle into that, um, when she, it kind of like slides into a familial desire, um, mm -hmm a kind of community or, or I don't know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I guess I just was wondering how you thought about projection among these characters and if that was a thread that you were trying to pull out while you were writing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. such a, no, that's such a nice question that, um, that I, that, that I've not taken up before and it's really central to the book, which is this confusion between, should we put our eggs on? What should we do? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw two eggs on the pan real quick. I'm just muting myself because I have to run the fan. Great. <laughs> Gosh, I'm so sorry that we're starting fires. Um, I am just going to quickly drop two eggs into the pan. One. Two. I just want to say I've never had so much respect for everyone. I, I know I just was making fun of them, but anyone who's doing cooking tutorials in an amateur fashion, I... Uh, I'm humbled. <laughs> I am too, and I've been frankly nervous about e this exact element of this event all day, and I feel totally justified in having been nervous about it now. <laughs> it's very tricky, but the eggs are going, and I, you're asking such questions that like, I, who needs the lunch, but we're doing lunch and it'll be delicious. Um, that question is a good one. Uh, that confusion between like, longing that is romantic, longing for family and longing for mentorship is like really at the center of the book. This woman is so addicted to receiving affirmation and validation from her mentor that um, when that validation is taken away from her, she can no longer identify what it was actually feeding in her, whether it was like romantic and sexual approval, whether it was the simple academic A plus gold star that is so um, sort of weirdly energizing since elementary school, whether it's a sense of community, whether it's a, a, a way of measuring her progress in her field, like all of these units of measurement and of success and of desirability um, become totally tangled and indistinguishable when when she can can no longer simply go to office hours and receive some direct feedback. Um, and I found that really interesting because I think everybody in every field encounters a situation where they become overly reliant on the approval of one or two um, key figures, whether it's a superior or a peer or a rival or whoever it is. All right, <laughs> turn the stove off. Um, and, and it can be incredibly confusing why we need, like at a certain point when you become aware of how much you need that approval, it can be pretty disorienting as to like, why do I need this from this person? What is it doing for me? And what am I in the absence of that approval? Um, and those were the questions that I was really trying to look at in this, in this book. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really fun to talk to you about it. Um, in part because I think you're highlighting it's one of the things that I, I thought was really subtle but lovely, which is that it's simultaneously a workplace novel and a campus novel yeah. um, in its own ways. And I think that that maybe has been, it's, it doesn't announce itself as such, but, um, but there are so many of those dynamics that feel very familiar <laughs> as someone who um, has spent much time on campus and in workplaces. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know. I think that there is also, there's so much overlap between that, that sort of drive for mentorship or for uh, an intellectual community and aspiration there, as well as in an in interpersonal one-on-one -on -one relationship. I mean, I just yeah. think of like, uh, I know so many <laughs> women who dated musicians in their 20s and what they actually wanted was to like have the camaraderie of a band. Yeah, not uh, yeah. The yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never done uh, that cleanly and that's totally right, yes. Well, 
I mean, I think about this for myself all the time. Like, I didn't actually want to work at startups. I wanted to be in a band. Um, but we can, we can talk about that some other time. Um, it's also interesting to hear you talk about it just selfishly because you and I went through this incredibly rigorous high school. Yes. That was all about measurement and comparison and achievement along a very narrow um, yes. sort of set of parameters or inside of a narrow set of parameters. And um, it's something I like. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. I don't know how no, you I feel about it. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it it has shaped my life, both good and bad. And it I found it really hard to shake that. Uh, after leaving Stuyvesant, which is this incredibly competitive, um, numbers-driven environment in which it's very hard to feel, there's a very specific way to feel worthwhile. Yes. Um, and I guess that sort of ties into another question that I had. I'm just gonna like do the uh, unglamorous, clunky segue, which is about beauty and, um, and a certain like sensuousness to this book and a, I would also say a sensuousness to the language. Um, like this is a, this is a book that takes great pleasure in language, I would argue. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's wonderful for that reason. I, that's a compliment. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious about you as a writer, having come out of this pressure cooker, math and science high school, you went to a pressure cooker, university, um, how you kind of carved a way for yourself or like the pretentious question I guess would be like, what's your, what is, what was your aesthetic education and what are you drawing from as a writer um, that, you know, that helps, lends itself to this kind of attentiveness to the sensual world? Is that an insane oh. question? No, <laughs> Sorry. A, you know, it's such an advanced and cool question and that it requires some real thought. Um, it's, it's remarkable to talk to you about this book, having gone to Stuyvesant with you. I didn't quite anticipate how sort of moving that would be, but it really is, you're, you're completely right to identify that as like the end origin of, of both of our drives. Um, and uh, that pressure cook envi cooker environment of very... Um, competitive schools has been a huge part of my life. Um, and as you say, I wouldn't have had it any other way because those schools gave me the opportunity to challenge myself in a way that I certainly wouldn't have challenged myself on my own. Um, but at the same time, they have absolutely created um, a certain level of um, expect addiction to uh, affirmate, to like feedback and to, um, if not approval, like measurement and uh, goal-oriented progress that um, at a certain point breaks down because when once you exit the school system, there isn't as clear a set of check marks ahead of you. And you wind up having to create the check marks or tell yourself what check marks are meaningful to you. And if you're not able to identify with any sense of clarity what um, milestones actually enrich your life, that whole way of moving through the world becomes pretty treacherous because um, there's no there's no meaningful path. Um, so I think my interest in beauty and aesthetics and language comes from the opportunities I had to study beautiful language from high school through college. I loved romantic po poetry in college and I loved music and theater in high school and all of that is in the aesthetic fabric of the work and I'm super thankful for that. Um, but now as I, I've really enjoyed, I and mean, I, I love leaving the city and writing this book in a non-urban environment where I could focus on the things that are important to me and not at all measurable, like my own dinner and like my own uh, little tchotchkes in my room and just a sort of private personal experience that has nothing to do with a workplace or a, or a campus um, and finding how to be rigorous about one's aesthetic inclinations in the absence of anybody who's gonna pat you on the shoulder about it. 
um, that's been really important the pa just the past couple of years. Um, I'm going to put these eggs on Anna. How do you, how's your sandwich going? Oh, I have two pieces of burnt bread and um, I will be assembling my sandwich after this event. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm just going to put egg number one. Take it off the I literally have one pan full of burning burnt oil and another <laughs> pan that wasn't even involved in this process. It's an innocent bystander pan with the sad bread in it. So <laughs> we'll deal with this later. Um, Great. <laughs> go back to the table. Great. Um, it's interesting. One of the things that, that occurred to me as you were speaking is just that Nell, um, to go back to this book, <laughs> Nell finds her, her outlet for beauty and for, um, and for pleasure in, in some way is actually her um, her academic work is, is botany and is this sort of uh, lush environment that she's growing in her own apartment. Yeah. Um, and also in, in dance, actually, there's a sort of wonderful um, know, part of the book that, that recur reappears toward the end, so I'm not, I don't want to, um, there's actually also, I have to say, I, I love reading about parties and I also love reading about dinner parties and I was, uh, Quite pleased. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah. this, but... I'm so happy to hear that because those dinner party scenes are actually some of the hard, the biggest hurdles for me in the book. So if and and I trust your party read sensibility <laughs> or none. So if you were feeling it, I am very satisfied. I mean, right. reading about a dinner party right now feels like looking at pornography that was custom made for me. So. <laughs> But I, but it's interesting that, that Nell finds that her outlet is her work. And I think that that's a kind of unusual depiction of, um, of science. And especially in, I mean, I think you, you might read that in a book like Lab Girl, which is a, a memoir about, um, you know, it's, it's told from the point of view of someone who's dedicated their life to something. But in fiction, it seems sort of unusual. Um, or maybe I'm just poorly read, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I appreciate that about the book. Uh, and I, I don't know, I also wanted to ask you, I guess, about obsession. Should I give you a minute to eat? I don't think so. I mean, are we eating? I, I think, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say that if you're cooking at home, I was gonna top my open face sandwiches with hot sauce and greens. And I encourage you to do that if you feel like it, but we didn't publicize these ingredients in advance and nobody's cooking. So let's just carry on. And, and I wish you a delicious lunch, whatever it may be. That's really the heart of the matter. It's lovely. It's where everyone's just here for the benediction. That's it's right. <laughs> um, yeah, obsession. I think, uh, I think that that manifests in two different ways for now, right? It's in, it's in the work and it's in, a, the sort of redemptiveness of the work, um, or, or the potential for redemption within the work, both in with respect to herself and with respect to to Rachel, um, her former lab mate, and of course in her obsession um, with Joan, who is her sort of mentor, advisor, uh, aspirational figure, storm cloud, rather than that. Um, <laughs> and I'm curious. I don't know what where, did you have influences in literature about, about obsession? Where did what sort of shaped your thinking on that? Um, do you yourself have any obsessions? Uh, I, I find I find any anyone with an obsession is like inherently worth um, listening to about that obsession. So, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, obsession for me, I think sometimes sits right between. Um, expertise and devotion if that makes any sense and they're and they're unrelated and so it's obsession is this weird thing where you can be obsessed with ballet you can be obsessed with a person and those are actually different feelings or they different pursuits but they both fall they're both discussed with that same word um and uh to me obsession more often than not is a sense of limitless devotion of this kind of entire 
um, placement of one's person in the service of loving another person. Um, I've always just been very romantic. I like, I like love as a, I, I like to be in love. I like to love. I like to love very, like, lovingly. Um, when you ask me what my obsession is, like, the total dork answer that comes first to my mind is my husband. Like, I love my husband. I love him so much. And, like, that's, that's a really sustaining force for me. But it's not like I'm, like, watching him while he, It's not, like, the obsession in the in the way that somebody who's obsessed with, I don't know, birds, like <laughs> tracks birds. It's just the, the, it's, they're different kinds of, of interests. But what I wanted to look at in this book is what it means to devote yourself to somebody. Um, and for the purposes of narrative, it's most productive for a character to devote herself to somebody who is not reciprocating that devotion because then it's an open loop that has more air to move around in whereas um you know the the trouble you get into with love stories on paper is that they can if they're too loving they're too closed and they're too small um so i liked giving nell this like infinitely receding target um that she could exercise herself toward infinitely um because now, because Joan is always receding and always stepping away from her, she's always running forward, and that kept the book moving. Mm -hmm. um, but it it was that basic impulse of I want to give myself to you that I think drives the obsession in in this book. But there are more esoteric forms of obsession to be sure, and they are very interesting to hear about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like that distinction between devotion and obsession that I think you just made. Um, and I'm also, I, there was a question that I wanted to ask you, but it's written on a piece of paper. Forgive me while I <laughs> move off screen. Um, uh, oh, sorry. It was, it was, I was reminded of it because you were talking about love and, and um, sort of a commitment to love and being loving in a particular way. And the book is very funny. I don't know, um, <laughs> I don't know that we have mentioned that, but the descriptions are funny. The, uh, some of the situations are darkly comic. Um, and I just, but there's also a lot of uh, profundity, I would say, about, it, it doesn't make a mockery of the characters, although um, Nell can be incredibly cutting and, and mocks some of the characters <laughs> with good reason. Um, it's I have to say it's some of the most uh, delightful descriptions of like um, unfairly handsome people that I've read in, in a long time. <laughs> um, and I'm curious how in writing it you how you thought about balancing humor with um, you know I, I think writing about love can be hard in part because it can be cloying and it can be um, tricky and uh, insufferable in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, and this this is not your book, sorry, that's not in your book. There's no, 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 no. <laughs> not the, that's not the tone. Um, but I'm curious how you balance these two things and if that was a conscious balance or if it just sort of, this is intrinsic to her voice and so it, um, it just came out as such. Um. Yeah, I, it's, I'm so, uh, I don't know, it means so much to me that you see these things in the book. Um, your mind is a mind that I've truly, truly revered for 20, 19 years. Um, so thank you for reading the book uh, with this. It was a pleasure. It is a pleasure of a book, can I it, just say. I yeah. really genuinely appreciate hearing that from you. Um, so Oh, thank you. Um, the humor, I mean, it's just so funny that you say that. It's so moving to me that you say that because my memory of grad school when I was writing my first novel, Sunlit Night, was 
breaking down in workshop in tears saying, I'm just not funny. Um, it was like uh, my friend and I had handed in our books and my friend is very funny and her book was very funny. And my book was mostly about flowers and goats and really not about humor. And I felt so shy about how sincere it was. I tend to be pretty earnest and um, I didn't, I didn't quite understand how to appreciate beauty and how to appreciate humor in the same book. Um, and then this book just sort of corrected itself. And I don't know, I think it's because there's something really funny about how wacko people become in social situations. Like the humor created itself. Um, but, and it, I was just so relieved to, to feel it and to be able to ride it. And, um, it's really central. Yeah, I, I, I do think you're right that that's sort of, whatever that is, the comedy is essential to Nell. It's how she gets through the world. It's how she gets through the pages of the book. Um, and it, 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 it was so inherent to the situations in the book that it didn't require me to, I, I'm very thankful that I didn't have to superimpose it onto the narrative. It just is a part of those scenes. And um, it made it more fun to write, which is always a good sign. Like if uh, it made it, it made it pleasant to occupy the world of the book because it was made of this like set, uh, funny little cri set of crises that um that I could have um, that I could laugh at. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's subtle, and I could see. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's subtle and I can see how that might, it's, you're, you're saying that you had like a crisis of uh, worrying that you weren't funny in graduate school just like makes me, um, <laughs> it definitely affirms some of my biases against MFA programs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine are similarly um, hotbeds of competition and yeah. uh, careerist tensions. But, um, yeah, it is, a, it is a subtle humor, and it's also, it's a defensive one. I think, I'm glad that you said that it's, it's, uh, it's her way of dealing with the world or of coping, because it does, it's, it's deployed in these moments of great vulnerability mm -hmm. often. Um, and there's something very Jewish, or in her case, half Jewish about that. <laughs> um, uh, I want to be mindful of Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. We have ten. I mean, I actually don't know. I could. I don't know if anyone else is here. Um, I don't either. Um, uh, but there's a question from Jenny. Yeah. Is oh, can you see it too? I see it. I have no secret knowledge. <laughs> I wish you did. I don't know if anyone else can see it. So the questions are: Does leaving the city help with those issues of professional and social envy? Does the internet make it harder to get away? So she asks, can I have an egg sandwich? Jenny, you cannot because we have abandoned ship. <laughs> you can, I wish I could give you the uh, totally unseasoned, uh, um, great, we do have people watching and uh, everybody can have an egg sandwich. I hope you go about having your own egg sandwiches. Uh, Jenny, um, does leaving the city help with those issues? Um, I, it did for me. Um, which isn't to say that you need to leave the city or, or that you can't solve those issues in the city, but having some time away to uh, take the temperature of my own values and my own instincts and my own actual cravings and habits um, definitely calmed me down um, to the point where I chose to live in the country, which is not, again, not a rejection of the city. I love living in the city and I, I love the city. But um, right now, my priorities are more nourished by the country. And that might not always be the case, but it feels the case for me right now. And um, the internet, I find, makes it easier to get away because I don't have to feel like I'm, get, I'm losing everything at once. I can still s see what people are up to and talk to my friends really easily. And, the connection, the connectivity of the internet has been such a gift um, in, to my geographic remove that um, I like, I like being able to stay in touch. Um, Anna wrote a smiley face and... Uh, well, that was just in response to... Uh... <laughs> 
I and are we? I mean, that might be all she wrote. Um, uh, hey, books. Questions? Is there anything you wanted to talk about, Becky, that we didn't? Touch no, on? you cover. You covered everything and then some, and I'm I'm amazed at the scope of our lunchtime conversation. <laughs> I have more oh. questions. Um, oh, this is a simple yes or no. Okay. Did you take botany at Stuyvesant? No, never zero. And really? chemistry was my worst subject at Stuyvesant <laughs> by far. Botany is the hardest fucking class I took in that school. It doesn't make any sense. I didn't even know there was a botany class. When did you get botany? What was bot what was botany class in high school? What did they do? It was a senior elective mm. that I took thinking I would be playing with plants, not yeah. plants that often, and it kicked my ass and I had to drop it because oh, no. I was worried that if I got a bad grade in botany, my college acceptance would be rescinded. Yeah, I mean, that was the way it was at Stuy senior year. It was hard. It's actually, I, I, I would have loved it if I hadn't been getting a grade. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating and incredibly hard. Uh, <laughs> there's a last call out for questions. Um. <laughs> in the meantime, I will just say thank you, Booksmith, and thank you, Anna. This is Hex. Um, if you buy it from the booksmith, uh, that would be awesome because they're a beautiful store doing heroic work of getting books out right now. And um, I wish that we could have been there in person to like really buy their books in person, but um, they're there for you online. And if there's anything I can do um, instead of signing to make it more personal, I would love to, so please be in touch. Um, and uh, thank you, Anna, so much for truly the most like thoughtful and uh, fascinating conversation. Oh, this was a delight. Thank you for um, teaching me how to make lunch. <laughs> I'm glad I got to see you, even though um, it would have been more fun in person, but we, we will do that for the paperback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, congratulations, Rebecca. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you, Anna, uh, for joining us. That was uh, a lot of fun um, from where I'm sitting. I didn't have a chance to, to make an egg sandwich um, uh, while you did that. <laughs> um, but, um, but thank you. Thank you again for joining us and um, best of luck with the book. Um, everybody who's, uh, who's tuned in and watching, thank you for joining us. And um, hopefully we can all gather in real life soon. Um, I'll drop the book link in the comments again and um, hope that you, you buy the book. We'll send it right to your door. And um, yeah, happy reading. Um, thank you guys again. Take care. Guys, thank you. Bye, everybody.